Our last storyteller, um, I asked her, um, this is an interesting note to end on, because I asked, I asked her what mystery would you like science to explain for us? And she said, um, I really like mystery, so it's okay if a couple are left unsolved. <laughs> uh, there you go. Some mystery fans, of course. Of course, they're applauding the word mystery. It's like, yes, random noun? Yes, I like that too. Okay, let's hear it for Trisha Rose Burt. My husband and I never really talked about whether or not we would have children. We just assumed we would. Our families expected it too. When my older sister got pregnant with the first grandchild, my mother bought this exquisite christening gown that she thought I could use too when I had children. And my husband, who's one of five children, Irish Catholic, when he told his father that we were getting married, the first thing my father-in-law said was, you'll be a great dad. We met and married in Ireland, and I was 38, my husband was 31. And as newlyweds, our first priority was not baby making. We changed continents. We moved from Ireland to New Hampshire, and we both changed careers. I left business to become an artist and a writer, and he left printing to become an ornithologist. All very sensible things to do with your lives. <laughs> and we were just settling in. Then I turned 40, and my husband says, well, I guess we ought to start trying to get pregnant. We try naturally with no success, and frankly, I'm offended. <laughs> For years, I'd concentrated on not getting pregnant. So I assume the first time I have unprotected sex with the man I love, I will instantly conceive. But as each month passes, I realize something alarming. Every time I get my period, I'm sad, but I'm also secretly relieved, like I've bought a little bit more time. We try nationally for a year, and then my doctor recommends that we go to a fertility clinic. Now, at this point, I'm 41, and the specialist says that if we want to do fertility treatments, that we have to start them immediately because the cutoff point at this facility is age 42. But there's a problem. I have my first major solo art show scheduled for Boston, and I don't think there's any way that I can make a major body of work and a baby using science at the same time. There's a standoff between my career and biological clocks. Every bone in my body tells me to pick the solo show. So with my husband's consent, we decide that we'll find a different doctor and try to make it work at 42. Now, the f most important thing they tell you to do as a fertility patient is to relax. And there's a good reason. When your body's stressed, you go into fight or flight mode and you produce adrenaline, which sends your body the message that it's not safe to reproduce. This is primal body wisdom. And so all the doctors and the books tell you to relax while all your family and friends say, oh, just get drunk and have sex. <laughs> like we haven't tried that already. <laughs> I'm a little wound up. And relaxing doesn't come that easy to me. So to help me in these efforts, I go see a highly recommended Chinese acupuncturist who speaks very broken English. And the first thing she says to me is, you're not very relaxing. <laughs> and she's right. <laughs> I am not very relaxing because I am terrified. 
I'm terrified of two things. One, of having a baby and all the freedom I will lose. And two, not having a baby and all the joy that I will miss. Holding these competing thoughts is wearing me out. And I'm already exhausted by trying to start this new artistic career in my 40s. But I am in my 40s. And I can't waste precious time figuring it out whether or not I want to be a mother. Keeping my maternal dilemma a secret, we move ahead with the treatments. Now, the first step is the Clomid Challenge. The Clomid Challenge uses the fertility drug Clomid to test for decreased ovarian reserve. If you have decreased ovarian reserve, it means you don't have very many eggs and they're not of good quality, so you're not a strong candidate for fertility treatments. Now remember, the most important thing that a fertility patient can do is relax, but the first thing they are required to do is to accept the Clomid challenge. <laughs> the irony is lost on the nurses and the doctors, and I am wondering if they are even listening to the words coming out of their mouths. I take the test, the results come in, and I am a candidate for every available baby-making science. This works for me because I feel best when I'm overachieving. We decide to go with intrauterine insemination, three rounds over six months, and this is how it works. On the first days of my cycle, my husband injects me with precisely measured drugs at the exact same time every day in the hopes of producing multiple eggs. Numerous sonograms track the development of the eggs, the insemination is timed with when I ovulate, which technicians determine by taking daily blood samples and looking for a hormone that peaks right before I ovulate. On the appointed day, my husband provides his semen sample and the nurses wash it in the laboratory, so it's just this highly concentrated, fast-moving sperm. And the doctor takes the sperm and injects it into my uterus using a catheter. The artist in me that loves mystery and romance hates these procedures. And my husband just patiently holds my hand. On our first round, we create one egg and one other little one that hasn't really matured yet, which we could have done at home on our own and saved $2,000 on the shots. But even though we haven't produced multiple eggs, the doctor goes ahead with the inseminations and we do two procedures in two days and he says nobody ever gets pregnant on the first try and he's right, we don't, but I'm still a candidate for everything. And the pressure starts to rise a bit because I have been raised to either be making money or making babies, and I am not doing either one. All I am doing is sitting in my studio making obsessive pencil sketches, and I'm not sure that counts. And I begin to think that there's something wrong with me, that I'm a bad person as I read about women who are so desperate to have children that they sell their homes and move to states where insurance covers the most radical fertility treatments. And I live in New Hampshire where nothing is covered and we have no intention of moving anywhere. Also, I'm slightly outraged that I can't get pregnant. I'm an artist, I make things all the time, why can't I make a baby? I talked to a dear friend of mine who has three children all through adoption, and she says, Trisha, do you want to be pregnant or do you want to be a parent? There's a big difference. I talked to another friend of mine who has three children all by in vitro, and she says, Trisha, a house isn't a home unless there's children in it. 
you need to go get $20,000 and go get in vitro or adopt. And when she says this, I have a visceral reaction. This pain literally shoots across my chest and I think, you know, that just can't be right. To top it off, a family member says, well, you know, the only reason why you get married is to have children. And I think, okay, so if we don't have children, does that mean my marriage isn't even valid? My therapist says, Trisha, I think you want people to think you're trying. And she may be onto something because ever since I can remember, I had the feeling I wasn't going to be a mother, but I was raised to be a mother and it's what I'm expecting. So there's this huge disconnect that doesn't make any sense to me. I then read that one of the major causes of infertility is ambivalence. <laughs> I'm working against myself. So I try to talk myself into all the joys that having a baby can bring. And at the same time, I pray to God that if we're not supposed to conceive, to please block it from happening. Babies come into the world, these beautiful, clean slates, and I don't want to mess some poor child up because I think I'm supposed to have a baby, and then I find out after it's way too late, I don't want one. I pray a lot these days, mostly asking God to save me from being so different from most everyone I know, because sometimes being different can be agonizing. Then one night I hear myself say, oh, please God, don't make me have a baby. And I'm shocked, but I am so tired and so confused that I override my own voice because I just can't trust myself anymore. We head in to round two and I am prepared. I have done yoga. I have done acupuncture. I am as relaxing as I am ever going to be. <laughs> First stop, blood work. And I go to the lab and they don't have my records because there's been sort of some sort of scheduling mix up. And my anxiety rises a bit and I think, well, you know, that's okay. Things happen. I'll just come back by after I've had my sonogram. So I go to the doctor's office and I'm in the waiting room and the nurse comes out and says, okay, Terry, come on back now, time for your sonogram. I, I say, but, but my name's Trisha. And she says, oop, my mistake which are not the words you want to hear at a fertility clinic. <laughs> the stakes are just too high. And I imagine them carelessly injecting me with the wrong person's sperm. And then without consulting me, the doctor drastically increases the number of prescribed shots I'm supposed to take during this cycle, and I know that these drugs are going to make me crazy. My anxiety skyrockets, all the yoga, all the acupuncture out the window. My husband says, Trisha, it's your choice. I'll support whatever decision you make, and I'll try as long as you want to try. But after this round, I'd really like to stop the treatments. It's just too stressful. We move ahead and finish up the treatment protocol. And then my reproductive system simply shuts down. All the hormone levels plummet. I produce just four tiny little immature eggs. It's as if my body uses primal wisdom or God answers my prayer and says, look, you obviously can't make this decision on your own, so I'm gonna do it for you. The doctor cancels the inseminations. Suddenly, I'm a candidate for nothing. 
I call a dear friend of mine who's an Episcopal priest, and I say, you know how God called Mary to have a baby? And she said, yeah. I said, well, I think God is calling me not to have a baby. I think I'm the anti-Mary. <laughs> and she says, oh, Tricia, there are so many reasons why you are the anti-Mary. <laughs> Once again, I'm sad and relieved, but mostly I'm just confused and scared. I'm actually okay with not being a mother, but it's what I always thought I was supposed to be. I don't know what to do now. I don't have a blueprint for this new life. I don't know what my purpose is or what my legacy is supposed to be. And the people who understand this the most are my gay men friends. They know what it's like to be thrown a curveball and find themselves outside the norm. So I asked three of them, what did they think when they first found out they were gay? And they all answer with the same phrase. I was terrified, but those, those were the cards I was dealt. I was terrified, but I knew I could handle it. I was terrified, but I knew I could build a good life. So I go back into my studio and I start to draw. <laughs>